question. All right, I've been asked to <coughs> to take a step back and do something very different, very different from what you've heard already today, very different from what you will hear. And I thought, now oh, that's an interesting challenge. So bear with me, take a deep breath. I'm not going to talk about marketing at all. I'm going to talk about innovation, the creative process, how it happens, um, and maybe uh, how we can allow it to happen more than it normally does. Um, for me, this whole thing started, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. About 12 years ago, almost 12 years ago, when this place was still called uh, the NAT Lab, Philips <laughs> Research Laboratories, I and a, and a couple of colleagues, we had an idea that uh, I thought back then, it, it is impossible that this is new. Either this is new, either this is not new, somebody already, already thought about, the, about this, or it doesn't work. It's complete nonsense. Because it was so simple, it was so obvious, yet it opened so, so many new avenues for, for technology development. To cut a long story uh, short, uh, it, it was new, it did work. We founded a company called Silicon Hive, uh, which eventually was sold to Intel a couple of years ago. And the technology that came out of that, today you can find some high-end mobile phones, high-end televisions. And <coughs> since then, I was very intrigued about this, this innovation process. What, what happens in our minds when we have an idea like this? I, I, I didn't feel like I had that idea. <coughs> I felt like the idea had me, that it, it seized me at some point for reasons that uh, I, I can't really pin down. And since then, almost 12 years, uh, I have been looking into this to this, this, this phenomenon, this phenomenon of, of creativity and innovation uh, that we all uh, partake in. Now, when we talk about creativity, most of us, especially in science, would think, you know, you develop new ideas by constructing them algorithmically in your brain. So it's a brain activity issue. Your brain's active, establishing new connections, connecting concepts, images, and ideas, and creating new ones, like a construction worker builds a building by putting bricks together. Uh, is there any one of you who thinks this is not how it works? Any one of you? There are about 100 people in this room. So about 10% of you don't buy into this. This is interesting. I thought there would be less. Because this is the paradigm today. This is the best assumption according to the values and, 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 and beliefs uh, of our scientific world. Yet, there are certain things that don't fit well with this. I, I, I'm not going to say that they are not explainable by the paradigm, but they don't, they don't fit well with it. For instance, the case of Tommy, an English builder, who you know, had, was full of tattoos and he described himself <coughs> as somebody who had absolutely no interest in the arts or in creativity, uh, short-tempered, that's how he described himself. And then he had a stroke one day landed in an operating table where the doctors operated in his brain and managed to save his life, managed to stop the bleeding. And of course, there was some damage in his brain afterwards. And the, as a result of that damage, he became compulsively creative. He began to paint every surface of his house, walls, ceilings, floor. Uh, last time I heard, he had done it five times over <laughs> because he, he, runs out, he, he ran out of space and the, the creative influx in him was so powerful that he needed to let it out. He needed to, to put it out somewhere, otherwise he would explode. And that was phenomenal that a brain malfunction would allow somebody to become so creative, so innovative, in a way that, that was so out of character. Now, if, if this was unique, we could dismiss it, right? It's an anomaly, you know, who knows why this happened, it doesn't matter. It's it's, it's, it's outside of the distribution. But it is not unique. There are many other cases. Dr. Tony Cicoria, for instance, was a doctor, never had any musical background, any interest, was struck by lightning in the head, and became a musical genius. He started playing the piano and composing. Today you can go to his website and buy his music. He gives concerts. Uh, or the case of Orlando Sorel, who was hit uh, in the head during a baseball game when he was 10 years old. And since that day, you can ask him, uh, he, can, he can give him a day, a date, like uh, 10th of October 2011, 
and he would tell you what day of the week that was and what the weather was, almost <laughs> instantly. And he does that without any difficulty. And nobody can explain how how that works. I mean, he got hit in the head. That was that was brain damage. Let's do it. I'm not suggesting <laughs> well, that, no, that no, you okay. go ahead and do it. Put him in the car. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Another case, um, Alonso Clemens, um, he fell when he was three years old and he hit his head in the ground very hard, hard to the point uh, that he became unable to take care of himself. Uh, his measured IQ is 40. The average IQ in this, IQ in this room probably is 120. Uh, so his IQ is a third of the average you. Uh, he doesn't speak almost. Uh, he can tie his shoelaces. He's completely dependent on other people because his brain has been damaged. But he's able to look for a few seconds at an animal. Then he doesn't need to look at the animal anymore. The lights can even be turned off and he's able to make perfect three-dimensional sculpture of what he saw only with the sense of touch. Uh, each one of these his small sculptures is selling now for over a thousand dollars. The guy makes a living out of this. Uh, he is a sculpturing genius, mm -hmm. if you will. <coughs> um, so what is happening here, right? I mean, it is almost as if, like the, the, the journalist from the BBC described this, it is almost <coughs> as if by damaging the brain, you open the gates to an influx of something that comes from the outside. It's almost as if these people would transcend themselves and, and gain access to something that is somewhere in the ether, in some platonic world of, of ideas and innovation. And there was a study published in 2010 uh, in the magazine, uh, neuroscience magazine, Neuron, where they had the opportunity to do a controlled study of this because some patients needed brain surgery for the removal of tumors and they knew that there would be brain damage. Every time that you remove a tumor, there is some brain damage. And they decided to interview these people before and after the surgery and evaluate an index that they call the index of self-transcendence. In other words, according to the evaluation of the person herself, how much is the person in contact with something that transcends them, something that is outside of them? And it turned out that for damage incurred in those two regions there, which are, uh, you know, look at this, where are they roughly? They're roughly here and here in the brain, uh, would increase the feeling of self-transcendence, the feeling that you're in touch with, with something that you, you see as outside of yourself, something outside of your ego. Uh, and it, this was a very carefully conducted study. So there is something going on here that we don't quite understand yet. Francis Crick is a Nobel Prize winner. He's the co-discoverer of the DNA. He's not any Nobel Prize winner. You know, there are, there are Nobel Prize winners and Nobel Prize winners, right? This is a real Nobel Prize winner, <laughs> as is Kerry mm -hmm. Merlins, uh, a Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry, uh, also a very serious uh, uh, scientist. And um, in the case of Kerry, uh, he said that already some time ago, Francis confessed to this at the end of his life. Uh, they both said that the key <coughs> Nobel Prize winning creative, innovative insights were had under the influence of a certain chemical. <laughs> Do you recognize the four rings? This is lysergic acid diphenamide. This is LSD. And they both said that under the influence of LSD, <laughs> they had uh, their Nobel Prize winning insights. Well, there are other examples, Steve Jobs, and the list could go on. Psychedelics are known <coughs> for increasing creativity. It's not a secret. And until very recently, there was nothing spectacular about this, right? Psychedelics, everybody thought, <coughs> gets your brain to fire. And as your brain's firing up crazily, new connections by chance are established. And every now and then, you can have a massively creative, innovative insight, right? No problem there. The problem is that in January of this year, well, beginning 2010 and 2011, they did a study and they decided that they wanted to see whether this is really what was happening. Is that what psychedelics do? They used a natural analog of LSD called psilocybin, which is not made in the laboratory, it grows in a plant. And um, so they 
stuck volunteers in a brain scan, <coughs> an fMRI, and they started measuring the brain under normal conditions, and then they would inject psilocybin and, and see what happens, both objectively in the brain and what people would report from that experience. And there were controls, people who just got saline solution, no psychedelics at all. And they compared brain activity between these controls and the people who did get the psychedelic. And they only measured reductions. All the blue areas you see are the areas in which brain activity was reduced compared to the controls. There is no increase in brain activity anywhere when psychedelics are in your brain. So, you know, the traditional explanation doesn't, doesn't do it anymore. You know, <coughs> this is more related to the case of Tony or Tony Chikora. And it, it's a, it's a, your brain goes to sleep <coughs> and you become more creative. That's basically what is happening. It fits the pattern I'm trying to, to, to suggest to you. And the pattern is much broader. Uh, if you have kids, you've probably heard of a very dangerous game uh, teenagers play called the choking game, in which they on purpose partially strangulate themselves and they try to keep themselves at the point where you're almost passing out but you're not quite passing out because that leads to a fantastic experience, an influx of information and insight that is almost addictive and some kids die uh, as an accident playing this game. What do you think happens when you constrict blood flow to your head? Your brain certainly doesn't start jumping around, you know, it has <laughs> less energy, <laughs> it's me less metabolism, uh, brain activity is less. And yet, the experience is uh, of insight and creativity. Yeah. Some forms of meditation use hyperventilation. You start breathing very deeply, very fast. If you think that increases brain activity, how many of you think this increases brain activity if you breathe very fast? <coughs> okay, uh, only a few of you are brave enough <laughs> to confess that that's what most people think. Actually, that's not what happens. Uh, uh, in fact, brain activity is reduced. That's why you pass out if you hyperventilate. Because the alkalinity level of your blood increases. Your body can't take that. So your blood vessels, your capillary vessels, constrict. And blood flow to the brain is reduced. You, you may pass out if you breathe too fast. And yet, some forms of yogic meditation and holotropic breath work, they aim at giving you unfathomable experiences increasing your creativity and uh, your, your understanding of the nature of reality even, precisely through hyperventilation, which reduces brain activity. So the correlation we are finding here is the opposite of what you would think, right? It, all, all of this seems to correlate with less brain activity or even brain malfunction, depending on the brain malfunction. More examples. Um, they put 500 people in a G-force accelerator, which drains blood out of your brain you know, pilots. And they asked these pilots afterwards, when you passed out, did you just black out, really? Or did you experience something? And these pilots would, were reporting things that were very analogous to a near-death experience, in which you basically have an amazing experience. You see a lot, you get a lot of information in. And that was kind of confusing, but that's what was, this was only in the 1990s. <coughs> Traditional cultures, like Indians, <coughs> pre-literary cultures around the world, their initiatory rituals, when you're a teenager and you're becoming an adult and you need to learn about the big secrets of nature, what do they do? They put you in a sweat lodge for hours, where you sweat your brains out, or you go through <coughs> ordeals, poisoning, and uh, extreme physical exertion. None of this is going to make your brain very healthy and operate very well, if you know what I mean. Yet, the traditional aim has always been to give you insight into what is really going on. Another puzzle in this. A modern technique called tra uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. They put a strong, but relatively strong magnetic field in your head, strong for the magnet magnetic fields that normally are in your head. It's a very weak magnetic field compared to the mobile phone. Either. Uh, and they managed to disrupt brain activity in more or less localized regions. And there was one patient in Switzerland who was epileptic, and uh, they deactivated a certain part of his brain, an angular gyrus, and the guy had an out-of-body experience, which was induced by a deactivation of the brain, which was strange as well. It's almost as if you can sort of 
gain access to, to something that is not in your head through a specific manipulation and reduction of, of brain activity. So what's going on, right? Some people in the past have speculated about this, and uh, th this figure is very appropriate because it gives you this suggestion that we are immersed in a kind of platonic world of ideas, of, of concepts, uh, uh, that we, if we would just allow in by relaxing, declenching our brain, uh, we would become very creative and, and innovative, right? People have talked about it in the past, um, just that platonic world of ideas that comes from Plato. Right. Plato saw the creative process not <coughs> as a process of construction, but as a process of discovery, of allowing in things that are already, already are in some kind of non-physical ether uh, in a metal world. Henry Bergson, a Nobel Prize winner as well, by the way, uh, uh, he thought of the brain as a sort of reduction valve. He thought that mind was everything. The brain is a, is a way for mind to sort of constrict itself and, and filter out of it of itself things that are not useful for the survival of the body. And uh, later on in the 50s, Aldous Huxley uh, echoed that same idea in The Doors of Perception. He writes two paragraphs in which he says exactly that the brain is a sort of reduction power. Uh, these views imply maybe a form of dualism, right? The mind is, of a, is a different stuff than the brain. I'm not sure I personally go there. I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself a dualist in that sense. Uh, but I do see the brain in a slightly different way than the, the current paradigm, and that's what I would like to share with you. When you, I'm almost through, by the way. <coughs> when you look at lightning in the sky, do you think of lightning as causing atmospheric electric discharge? I mean, that, that image of lightning, you don't see that as the cause of atmospheric electric discharge, right? Yeah. That is the image of the process of atmospheric electric discharge. When that process is going on, the way it looks to you, if we give a label to that, we call it lightning. It's absurd to say that lightning is the cause of electric discharge. It's just the way it looks. Mm -hmm. It's the image of it. Uh, my own thinking is that the brain is the image of a process by means of which mind constricts itself for survival advantages. It's not useful for you to see a tiger roaming around in India right now. You probably wouldn't be sitting in this chair, <laughs> running to the door. Um, so I, I don't see it as something that mind is separate from the brain. I see the brain as a process in mind that looks to us in a certain way, just like lightning looks to us in a certain way. And in the case of the brain, the analogy I like to make is it's a kind of whirlpool of mind. You know? There's nothing to the whirlpool, to a whirlpool, but water. Yet water in the whirlpool sort of localizes itself. It circles around a specific point until it eventually dissolves and joins the rest of the stream. And my own philosophical approach to this is to look at the brain as this image of a whirlpool-like process in the medium of mind. And that could maybe suggest an explanation for why the process of innovation process of creativity is not so much as this fist tension <coughs> that creates something in our brains, right? Let's get our neurons firing up. Apparently that's not how it works. Apparently the way it works is that if you allow your mind to declench, relax, let activity go down, let things come in, let the influx come in, pay attention to it as it's coming in. Then maybe you'll be seized by a hundred million dollar idea like a some of us in this room have been seized in the past. And that's what I want to leave you with. And if you want to read more, that's how you can contact me. Thank you. Bernardo.